because I do see myself as part of this family. I see myself as the, uh, the Vietnamese pastor of True North <laughs> Church. And uh, to all those uh, joining us from uh, Marawa and online, it is good that you're here. And I do pray that uh, you get to also lean in to the preaching of God's Word and that you would hear God through His Word this morning, that God would use me to speak to you. Uh, I really love this community. I really do. I really do feel that this is family, and I do love this church. I love your leaders. I love your senior pastor, Pastor Dean and Lisa. Um, I know that you're up in Marawa. You guys are uh, the world to me. I am so glad that God would place us on the same path of doing ministry for, I guess, over two decades I've known Pastor Dean, and it's good that uh, we get to call each other brothers and, and sisters in the Lord, that we get to serve uh, our Lord and Savior in the city of Perth. God bless you guys. Uh, thank you so much for trusting me uh, with this moment. I do not take this moment lightly. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to teach God's Word to the people, to the brothers and sisters here at True North. And I do pray that as we uh, study the text together, you do not just hear me, but hear God's Word for you. That we don't leave going, well, that was entertaining, but rather, no, I heard from God. And not just as a hearer, but also a doer of God's Word. That's the whole idea with God's Word. is It leads to transformation so that we are walking closely to our Lord and Savior, to be like Him. So my prayer is that for you all. And so thank you so much for the privilege and the honor. So I'm going to pray now and just invite God's Spirit to really be our great teacher in this time. So Father God, I thank you always that you would entrust me with your Word and your people in moments like these. And I, yeah, I'm grateful and I'm so honored and so I pray right now that your spirit will be our great teacher as we study your word together. Lord, would you give me your strength? Would you give me your word? May you speak to your people here. May I never, ever take this moment for granted. Yeah, would you use us all right now? In Christ's name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. You know, around 10 years ago, uh, Disney World executives, uh, they were wondering what would really capture the attention of toddlers and uh, infants at their theme parks. So they hired some cultural anthropologists, right, to uh, study all the little children as they entered the theme parks. Was it the roller coasters that captured their attention? The sweet-smelling snacks? Or was it the friendly cartoon characters? Or the energetic dancers? Or was it just the colorful toys that one could purchase? Now, these cultural anthropologists discovered this one thing that most captured the attentions of the little children. Are you ready for it? Their parents' mobile phones. <laughs> yeah. Especially when their parents weren't using it. You see, in their little minds, these mobile phones must have been more important than the theme parks. So they kept looking at these mobile phones, and they stopped looking and focusing on the external external environments of the theme park. Now, studies have said this, is that what captures us, right, captures our attention, actually wires our brain cells. So what we focus on ends up controlling our thoughts and our actions and our values and eventually our lives. So St. Augustine, he says this, the mind commands the body and it instantly obeys. Just recently, Caroline Leaf, a neuroscientist, she says this in her book, your body is not in control of your mind. Your mind is in control of your body. And your mind is stronger than your body. Mind certainly is over matter. Now, you see, Satan is very smart in wanting us to shift our eyes off Jesus. He wants us to be captivated by the things of this world, ultimately, that we never, ever fix our eyes on him and we reduce Jesus to just being someone who's ordinary and normal and predictable and someone we think of once a week when we gather here as the people of God. I'll give you an example. I live not too far from the University of Western Australia. And on my drive home from work every day, I pass by that iconic blue boat shed. You know the one I'm talking about? The famous shed that people would risk their lives just to take that Instagram-worthy shot. There might be a picture there somewhere, you know. Well, I remember the first few moments uh, of months of living in the area and driving home, I would 
take my time driving home from work. I would enjoy the nice scenic drive along Riverside Drive, looking into the majestic Swan River as I watch all these tourists trying to you know, escape death crossing the highway to get to the blue shed. Well, you fast forward to the present day, we've been living in the area for now over 15 years. You know, my drive home today, it's really just A to B. I'm not even thinking about the uh, blue shed. You know, I, I, I tell you right now, it's normal. I tell you right now, if I look on my social media feed and I see someone in front of the blue shed with that photo, like that, you know, it's like, I don't really care. It's normal. I see it all the time. It's predictable. That's why Dane Ortlight, in his book Deeper, he says this, make your growth journey a journey into Christ. Explore uncharted regions of who he is. Resist the tendency that we all have to whittle him, that's Christ, down to our preconceived expectation of what he must be like. Let him surprise you. Let his fullness arrest you and boy you along. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I believe a lot of us, me included, we live such a fast and busy and hectic life that the only time we remember Jesus is when we gather as the people of God. That throughout the week, we're so busy, one thing after the next, that's why the Dutch writer, Corrie Ten Boom, she says this, if the devil can't make you sin, who'll make you busy? You get so busy, and life is so fast, and you forget the beauty and the majesty of Jesus Christ, and Jesus now becomes normal. He becomes average. He becomes predictable. He becomes someone that we remember once a week. Are you with me? And so what I want to do today is just fix our eyes back on Jesus, the beauty and the majesty of Jesus as we look into the text. And Paul does that beautifully in the letter to the Colossians, in 2 Colossians. Okay, you have your Bible, turn to me to Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. This is the Word of God. Let me read the Word of God and let me expound it afterwards. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. And he is the head over every power and authority. And in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands, no, your whole self-rule by the flesh was put when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave us all our sins. And verse 14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. And he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. You see, the, the Christians in Colossae were told by these false teachers that they were missing a few things in their walk with Jesus. If you understand the letter to the Colossians, these teachers were saying, you're not there yet, you've got to be circumcised. In fact, you've got to keep the dietary laws. More, you've got to be able to speak to angels. You've got to have these ecstatic experiences and encounter, and then you're there. So you're missing something. And so Paul starts off in this section by saying, do not let them take captives through their hollow and deceptive philosophy. You see that? He says, don't let them shift your focus off the gospel. Don't let them fool you. And now he brings their attention back to Jesus. And he says, now keep your eyes open on Christ. Three things he does wonderfully, if you're taking notes. The first thing is this, he says, don't forget of this personal possession that you have. Look in verse 9 and 10. He says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. You see what Paul is saying right there? He says, the fullness of deity dwells bodily. 
The God who created the universe, the God who inspired scripture, the God who parted the Red Sea, the God who was with Daniel in the lion's den, the God who spoke to the prophet, the God who is in complete control, he is fully present in human form, the man Jesus. There is nothing missing of God in Jesus. And he says in verse 10, you have been filled in him. You see that? Some translation, in him you have been made complete. You see what Paul is doing? He's saying that Jesus is everything. You have him, he's all that you need. I don't know about you, but when you think of being made complete or being filled in, that means there's no room for anything else. Would you agree? When was the last time you went to a buffet, all-you-can-eat buffet? Say the Epicurean down at the Crown. Ever got to the point where you have so much to eat that it hurts when you laugh? The thought of actually getting up and going to your car is painful, so you pray and hope that someone would roll you out of the restaurant and into your car because you're so full and so filled, there's room for nothing else. And what he says right here, he says to the Colossians, and he says to those Christians following Jesus, you have Jesus. He completes everything. He's the fullness of God, and he belongs to you. So when you place your trust in him, you get all of God, not part of God, the complete fullness of God. If Jesus is all that you have, he says he's all that you need, nothing more. And these false teachers were saying, well, you're lacking this, and you need more, and you need to have this before you are complete. He says, no, don't forget about the personal possession that you have the fullness of God in Christ. Friends, what is the world telling you today? What is captivating and drawing your mind and shifting you off Jesus today? Is the world saying you are lacking because you need more A, B, C, D? The world tends to say this, if you have more money, then you're complete. If you take the next step up the corporate ladder, then you're complete. If you have that next business investment, then you're complete. If you find someone to love you, if you get married, you get that Tom Cruise, Jerry Maguire, you complete me moment, then you're complete. Is that what the world is saying to us today? Can I say the word of God is very clear that we have Jesus, the fullness of God, and Jesus is all that we need? I just want to say this in regards to relationship. The church, if we're not careful, we paint a picture that unless you find someone who loves you and you get married, then you're complete. I think we have to be very, very careful. If you're single and you're ready to mingle, go for it. <laughs> but don't think that until you find someone who would love you and you would love them and then you get married and then you're complete. No. The text is very clear that we are complete in Jesus. Jesus is all that we need. He completes us. Yes, you can desire to find someone to love you. You can desire marriage. That's all wonderful. But don't think that until that takes place, you're now complete. No, you are made full in Christ. He's all that you need. That's why C.S. Lewis, he says this, he who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God only. He's all that you need. If you have Jesus and he's all that you've got, Friends, he's all that you need, and Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Don't let this world fool you. Don't subscribe to the lies of this world that you've got to have something, and then you're complete. You have him, this personal possession that Christ is in you, and you get to enjoy him now and forevermore, and he's all that you need. So if you think right now you're lacking, that's exactly what the devil wants you to think because he wants to shift your focus off Jesus to something else. I want to draw your eyes back upon Christ and remember that the day you gave your life to Christ, that day you have the fullness of deity in bodily form, Jesus in you, and he's all that you need. Amen? Amen. Number two, he says, 
Not only there's this personal possession, you have this radical regeneration. We see this in verses 12 and 13. He says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. You see what Paul is saying right here? He says to the Colossians, when you place your trust in Jesus, you have been baptized in him. And the baptism here is not talking about water baptism. A baptism in the New Testament talks about identification with his death and resurrection. And so what Paul is saying is that when you place your trust in Jesus, that moment, you've died with him. Your old is gone, but the text also says you've been raised with him. You're alive and made new. At the end of verse 13, God made you alive together with him. You are now the new self. So theologically, we call that our new birth or regeneration. And so what Paul is saying, do not forget of the radical regeneration that's taken place when you place your trust in Jesus. The old is gone, the new is here. That is something we must never, ever forget and live that out. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, I had an issue with my, um, my mobile phone, an Apple mobile phone. So I took it to the Apple store in the city of Perth, and I said, look, can you have a, a look because there's something wrong with my phone. Run a test, please. And so they ran some tests, and they found out there was a, a fault with my phone, and they were so nice. They said to me, well, Mr. Nguyen, uh, we will give you a new refurbished phone. I left with this beautiful new phone. It was like, uh, like there was no scratch in it. It had a little nice protective film that can pull off the screen, and I had a box, and they even gave me a 12-month warranty. I, I left on top of the world with this great phone, and I said, well, praise God that I am not like the other Android people when I'm with <laughs> Apple, you know? <laughs> In my humble opinion, in my humble opinion. But do you know that in Christ, listen carefully, you are not refurbished, you're not renovated, you're not brushed up, you're new. You're brand new. You are new and the old is gone and the new is here. And we must never ever forget that. It cannot be something that's in our mind. No, it has to be in our hearts, and we have to live out the new. And Paul says this to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Must never, ever forget that you are new. The old gone, the new is here. You've been radically regenerated. Your past is your past. Now you are new. If you hear the voice of the old self bringing up the things of the past, the hurts of the past, the failures of the past, the habits of the past, you speak back and you say, that's not me. That's not me. The old is gone. The new is here. I am new in Christ. I have a new beginning I have a new purpose. I have a new destiny. I have a new hope. I have a new life. I am new in Christ. Old is gone. New is here. And you must live out that reality. Because I tell you right now, a lot of times we know it up here, but we're not living it out. Because that old voice says, I know you. I know your old you. I know your old habits. You say, no, I'm new. The new is here, the old is gone. And you live out that reality. You must never, ever forget that. I have someone in my church who just went into prison at the start of the year. This young man here received the Lord a few years ago, baptized at Sun Life Church. I saw him probably three weeks ago. I had a chat with him, see how he's going, and... Uh, I thought I'll come to encourage him, but he encouraged me. He says to me, Pastor, I know I'm stuck here, and this is how it is. I'll be here for the next two to three years. But I know I'm so loved by God. I know that God has a purpose for me, and I know that I'm still 
you know, a child of the Most High. He's living out the reality that he has a new life in Christ, despite his circumstances. He knows that he's new. Yeah, there's certain things of the past that might, maybe might explain who we are, but it doesn't define who we are. We are defined by Christ, and we are new. And so he says to me, well, Pastor, I'm actually uh, learning to play the electric guitar. I said, all right, cool. What for? When I get out, I want to be in the worship team. And I'm trying not to cry. Because he goes, that, yeah, this might be my situation right now, but I still have a new beginning. I have a new hope. I have a new purpose because I'm new in Christ. And he goes, I'm also doing a short course. Oh, really? In what? Just counseling those with mental health. And I said to him, I know why. He goes, you know why? Because when I get out there, I want to help those who struggle with mental health. Here is someone, despite their circumstances, is living out the reality that they are new in Christ. They have been radically regenerated. For a lot of us here, we must never forget that. We are new. We are made new by the grace of God. And we're to live that out to whatever season you may be in right now. Don't let the voice of the old say, look at you. You're going back to the old. I can see that nothing has changed. Look at the old mistakes. Look at what happened in the past. That's why you can't take on this new project. You shout back and say, no, I have been radically regenerated. Old is gone. The new is here. I have a new purpose. I have a new chapter. It's a new beginning, and I'm living out that new life. Paul says to the Colossians, that's you. And God says to every one of us here, that's us if we place our trust in Jesus Christ. He says, don't forget the beauty of Christ. Not only there's this personal possession, there's also this radical regeneration. And now he moves to the third one, this colossal cancellation. We see that in verse 14, the last verse. He says, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. You know, the word debt here in the Greek means a receipt. It means a bill. It means that every time you go and order some food, you know, whether it's some banh mi thit or some pho dak bik or some bung bo hue, you know that I'm Vietnamese, right? And I'm thinking about food right now, right? I'm a bit hungry right now, right? You know, at the end of that eating session, at the end of the night when you go to the counter, Everything that you've ordered that evening, all the food and all the drinks and all the desserts, where do you find it? On this bill. And guess what? Someone still has to pay for it. If not, you're all in the kitchen, right? <laughs> cleaning, cleaning the dishes. You see, friends, every time we do something we shouldn't do, every time we say something we shouldn't say, every time we think of something we shouldn't think, Anything that's evil towards God or towards one another, we find that on this bill. We find this on this receipt. And trust me, the longer you live, the longer the receipt gets. And the Bible is very clear that this receipt, this bill, this debt, the Bible is very clear. It stood against us. It's accusing us. It's condemning us. It's anti us. It's hostile towards us. But the text is also very clear. It has been canceled. It has been wiped clean. It was nailed on the cross. Paul says, don't forget that. All your wrongdoings, all your evil, anything that's sinful, nailed on the cross with Jesus. He died, he rose, so that the debt that was owing towards God completely canceled. And that's what we see in the text here. Wiped clean. Clean as a whistle, as if it's never happened before. And I say this all the time to all the people that I minister to, that if you know half as much as what God knows about me, you wouldn't want me to be your preacher. But I am so grateful that he cancels all my debt. I am so grateful that my Jesus died in my place and he rose for me so that the bill, the debt that is owing towards God the Father has been completely cancelled. The prophet Isaiah says this in Isaiah 43, 25, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. 
and I will not remember your sins. I just love that. I have to always remind myself that I'm walking a life where God sees the one I'm in, Jesus. And because Jesus has done it all for me, and Jesus, who is blameless, who is perfect, the Father sees Jesus, the one that I am in, the Father sees me as being pure, blameless, sin-free, all my debts cancel because of his blood. And I must never, ever take that for granted. That's why I love the hymn from Robert Lowry, What Can Wash Away My Sin? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He says, oh, precious is the flow. And that's the blood that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He cancels all our debt. He forgives us. We must never forget that. May we be transformed by what He has done on the cross for us. May it lead to a life worthy of His death so that we don't just remember Him once a week. We remember Him throughout the week. We remember this colossal cancellation of clearing all our debt, all our sin, so that we stand holy and pure and blameless and perfect before Him. And that's why Paul says to the Ephesians, he says this in Ephesians 4, 1, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you, he urges all the Christians to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Every one of us here, if you have received the grace of God in forgiving your sins, that colossal cancellation, may we live a life worthy of our salvation. May that life be one that is transformed. May that be a life where we always remember our Lord and Savior, we'll fix our eyes upon Him, and He never ever becomes normal and average, and predictable, and we diminish him down to someone we remember once a week on a Sunday. But every day, he's beautiful. That our eyes are always fixed upon his majesty and his purity. Oh, we love him. And it leads to a life of transformation, wherever he leads us. I love it how this church here, we gather here to encourage one another to keep living for Him and to leave this morning as people on fire to reach many. But we have to make sure that every day we fix our eyes upon Him, not just waiting for Sunday so that we get charged up, so that we can go out on Monday. Every day, oh, we love Him. That He never, ever becomes normal or average or predictable but he becomes the one that we love daily. And that's what Paul does. He says, don't let this world shift your attention off the beauty of Jesus. He says, don't forget the personal possession. You have him. He's all that you need. Don't forget that radical, whoa, regeneration that you're now new, new in Christ. And never forget the colossal cancellation He's canceled all your debt that you stand innocent before Him as if nothing has ever happened before. And I believe if we remember these three things, we will never shift our focus off the beauty of our Lord and Savior. And whatever this world comes to tempt us, to capture our minds, we say, no, no. Jesus is the one who still captures my mind. He's the one that I love. He's the one that I follow. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. You know, as I begin to just pray for you, maybe there are some of you this morning where you need a prayer for just reminding yourself that Jesus is all that you need. And this is to those watching online or those at the other campuses. I want to pray for you. 
I want to pray that you remember that Jesus is all that you need. You are not lacking if you have Jesus. For some of us here, maybe we know that we are new in Christ, but the old self, it's always reminding us of the past. I also want to pray for you. And for anyone here who is not living, worthy of God's cancellation of your debt, I pray that God will change you, that you never take the cross for granted. So can I just ask everyone here and those joining us online, if that is you and if you would love me to pray for you, all I want you to do is just raise your hands so that I know who I'm praying for. Thank you. I just want to pray for you. I believe there's something wonderful about prayer as we pray for each other. God does a work in our heart. If that is you, you raise your hands, and even those joining us online as well. And it will be my joy and my honor to pray for you, that God will do something beautiful in you in your life as of this moment forward. So that's you. You raise your hands now. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Let me pray. Let me pray. Father, I just thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much that, Jesus, you are beautiful. We love you so much. Thank you for reminding us that you are, you are worth it. You are, you are all that we need. For those right now who are struggling with that reality, they're looking for the next thing, something more. Oh Lord, remind them, if they have you, that's all they need. You're more than enough. I pray, God, they find that joy in, in knowing that they have you, the fullness of deity in bodily form. I also pray for anyone here who knows in their mind that they are new, but they're not living out the newness of life. I pray, God, Lord, I pray, God, that they will live out what it means to be new, that the old will never define them. God, you do. They're new in Christ, and they live it out as of this moment. And I also pray for those who feel that there is a sin that you haven't forgiven yet. No, God, remind them there is no sin that you cannot handle. You forgive all sins. You've canceled the debt. And we stand righteous before you. So Lord, I pray right now for those individuals. Thank you, God, that you are worth it. You're beautiful. Help us to always keep our eyes upon you and not the things of this world. And Lord, every day we remember you. Every day we are worshiping you. Every day we're in your word. Every day we're praising you. And we're not waiting to Sunday. No, we've got you every day. On Sunday, we come here as a family, yeah, as a climax of our week to lift your name upon high. Thank you so much for your word, oh Lord. May we not just be hearers, but also doers of whatever you've been saying to us. In Jesus' name.